Dr. Hal Putoff was born on June 20, 1936. Before he got his master's in engineering, Mr. Putoff was already recruited by the Sperry Electronic Tube Division in Florida at the age of 23, working on the research of electronic beam focusing. Four years later, he joined the Stanford University, working on lasers and nonlinear optics, from which he got his PhD. In 1972, Putoff joined the famous Stanford Research Institute, better known as SRI, in the Electronics and Bioengineering Laboratory, working on parapsychological phenomena. This is where it gets interesting, because Dr. Hal Putoff is connected very deeply into the remote viewing program, having tested famous remote viewers like Ingo Swan, Pat Price and Joe McMonagle. In 1978 his team remote viewed for the likes of CIA, Air Force and the DIA. The results were astonishing. I was a straightforward laser physicist at Stanford University. Uh, I graduated my PhD there and uh, <clears throat> then I um, worked on a textbook, graduate level textbook on quantum electronics and lasers. And there's nothing like writing a textbook on the subject to realize how much you don't know. And one of the things that struck me as uh, I was working on the book was that we have a pretty good quantum description of all kinds of mechanistic, inorganic uh, interactions, but we don't have a quantum theory that even begins to touch on mind. The very first Soviet facility we looked at uh, was over in the Soviet Union and it turned out our remote viewer, Pat Price in this case, drew a picture of a crane and he said, uh, I'm lying on my back on top of a two-story building and this crane is rolling over my head and it's so large that a man is only half a wheel height. Well, when he told me that, I I thought that was ridiculous, but in fact it turns out that's exactly what the site was like. I don't know if you can see here, but uh, in fact that little dot there is a man. And so when we asked him, well, what do you think the site is used for, he said, well, I think it's for some space application. It was only after the Cold War was over and people from our country got to visit the location, we found out that in fact, this was for a space application. So the major area that we're looking at actually is, has to do with the fact that although empty space appears to be empty, quantum physicists know it's not really empty. It's uh, full of what we call quantum fluctuation energy or vacuum energy. This picture was talked about in the Sean Ryan show with Joe McMonagall. They were able to find a foreign spy on US soil mid-operation in the most remote place just by remote viewing. Joe McMonagall has a lot more stories to tell on the Sean Ryan show. The original video is 6 hours long and very captivating. I mean he found like a dozen missing children through ESP. If you don't have that kind of time, I made a highlight clip. Both are linked in the description. So-called empty space isn't really empty at all. It's actually full of energy. So instead of being like kind of a quiet, empty lake, it's more like the froth at the base of a waterfall or something. And this energy is basically electromagnetic in nature. And uh, <clears throat> the energy density is uh, quite high. In fact, it's so high that when it was first discovered mathematically, it was thought to be some kind of artifact of the mathematics. But then as time went on, there were and even Nobel Prize winning experiments that showed that this energy in so-called empty space was really there. We don't usually notice it because um, it's so homogeneously distributed. It sort of be like sitting in a bathtub with uh, at exactly your body temperature. You might not notice, notice the water. But under certain circumstances it can be um, disturbed or perturbed and then it has, has effects. As I mentioned, some, some effects on atomic emission, for example, is what eventually ended up uh, in a Nobel Prize for Willis Lamb of Yale University, and it's called the Lamb Shift. And this is a recognition that, in fact, uh, this energy disturbs atoms, so atoms aren't sitting in a void, they're sitting in the sea of energy. So once uh, quantum theorists realized that energy was there, the next question was, well, <clears throat> is there any way to tap it? And it was thought uh, originally that Probably not. It might be like trying to tap the heat energy around us. And uh, you can quickly prove for thermodynamic reasons that uh, it'll take more energy to tap it 
then you'd get out of it so you don't come out ahead. But back in uh, about 1984, a researcher at Hughes Laboratory by the name of Robert Forward uh, showed that there was a particular effect called the Casimir effect, which demonstrated that, in fact, this energy could be tapped. If you suspend two uncharged metal plates in a perfect vacuum, you'd expect both plates to stay completely still. In reality, though, the plates would slightly move towards each other. This is the Casimir effect. See, behind the classical view of this example, there's the quantum view. Here, the quantum fields of different fundamental particles are constantly interacting with each other. Although this interplay of fields is complicated to fully understand, the resulting effect is that there are infinitesimally small reactions occurring on the subatomic scale. We call these reactions virtual particles. These particle-like entities pop in and out of existence, barely ever being a part of our reality. However, as they interact with each other, they produce extremely small forces. When taking into account that there's almost an infinite amount of these virtual particles, their combined force becomes quite substantial. And since there's more space on either side of the metal plates than in between them, the virtual particles exert a net force that pushes the plates towards each other. So even in a vacuum, the universe announces itself through the Casimir effect. You find out that there's enough energy in the volume of a coffee cup to evaporate all the world's oceans that you could get it all of it. In 2021, the Department of Defense published a Navy document which is freely available on their FOIA page talking about some kind of machine, namely the High Frequency Gravitational Wave Generator. The way it is being written about makes one believe this machine does exist and was already put through testing. I mean, is it already an invention if you haven't produced it yet? Per definition, it shouldn't be. This document breaks our understanding of physics with this first sentence. It is possible to generate high frequency gravitational waves exhibiting power levels of 10 to the power of 10 watts. Plain and simple. For some reason, this is still no public knowledge. I'd highly recommend you visiting the DoD FOIA page and take a thorough look for yourself. Just another thing we can apparently do, destroy planets and time travel. Utilizing the high frequency, high energy gravitational waves generated with the high frequency gravitational wave generator can, not could, but can, be used in a variety of applications ranging from advanced field propulsion to communication through solid objects, as well as asteroid disruption and disintegration. This high-frequency gravitational wave generation is, not should be, but is accompanied by high-frequency electromagnetic radiation, which can further alter the local space-time energy density, thereby manipulating the local vacuum energy state. So it's like a black hole. When you increase space-time energy density, Time flow inside your bubble slows down so that you look like moving in slow motion to an outside observer while the outside observer itself to you looks like it's moving x time faster than it normally should. If you flip this around, meaning if you decrease space-time energy density, you to the outside observer could potentially move faster than the speed of light and do a perfect right turn without becoming a 2D pancake through the law of inertia. Your relative speed might be let's say 10 miles an hour, but time around you literally froze in place, allowing you to subjectively fly faster than the speed of light, depending on your frame of reference. Last but not least, this is what it all means. Utilizing the high frequency gravitational wave generator, our United States warfighters will achieve battle space supremacy against all foes. This possibly revolutionary technology bridges state-of-the-art engineering, applications with the latest advances in theoretical and applied physics. Take that in for a moment. So, the question remains, how is the military able to test something like this? I mean, 10 to the power of 10 watts seems like a lot, doesn't it? Let's break it down. 10 to the power of 10 means a 1 with 10 zeros, so 10 billion watts, or 10 gigawatts. According to the American Office of Nuclear Energy, a typical nuclear reactor generates 1 gigawatts of energy. To reach the energy necessary, you would need to copy-paste 10 private nuclear reactors working at full capacity just to charge the gravity generator. On the other hand, if you take the energy inside the space taken by a coffee cup, you'd get this much gigajoule. If now for fun we were to look how long this cup energy would power our generator, some quick maths later we would see would be approximately for 11,839,643,582 years.
All that said, I'm not a physicist and I get my information from Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange as any student does. I put the links in the description for your scrutiny. It baffled my mind, however, how abundant energy in our universe actually is and how little of it we, the casual human, make use of it. If you tried to compare our capabilities to us in a thousand years, it would be like asking some random Joe in the Middle Ages to make heat. The individual would start a fire. If you ask him how he'd achieve more heat, he'd say a bigger fire. If you then ask him what the most powerful source of heat would be, he'd say a fire as big as the world. In no way he'd tell you about bombs or nuclear reactions because he doesn't know. Nor could he imagine it, it's not part of his world. I guess what I'm trying to say is, let's be open-minded to possibilities beyond our current capabilities. Because frankly, the universe doesn't care what you and I are ready to accept. I hope I could spark some curiosity. See you next time.